Shalom, my brothers and sisters. Good evening, good morning, wherever you are around the world. We're going to have a little fun study um, tonight. We're going to be reading in 1 Samuel about the story of Jonathan and how he fought against the Philistines. Not many people read this story in the Bible, but tonight we are going to dive into something really fun and interesting, I think. And there's going to be some really really good word in this study tonight, so stay tuned. Let's get into it right now. So, I'm excited for this one. First Samuel, chapter 14, and we're going to start in verse 6, all right? Then Jonathan said unto the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. Okay, so for context, let's get started here. Israel is at war with the Philistines, right? And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, All right, let's go up. Let's go up to uh, a place where some of the Philistines are at. Let's go into the enemy's camp. Let's go attack them in their domain, right? Let's go to the cliff where their stronghold is, and let's attack them. <clears throat> and his armor bearer, well, let's keep reading. So his armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart. Go then, I am with you according to your heart. All right, where two or three are gathered in the name of the Lord, there he is in the midst of them. There's two right here, ready to go. God's going to be with them, right? So, his armor barrier said to him, go, I am with you according to your heart. I am in agreement. Agreement is powerful today, right? Agreement. When you have a brother or sister with you in agreement, there is nothing that you can't do. If one can put a thousand to flight, right? Two can put 10,000 to flight. Glory to God. Let's keep reading. Then Jonathan said, very well, let us cross over. To these men, and we will show ourselves to them. We're going to show ourselves to the enemy, right? In spiritual warfare, you show up to the camp, and you show yourself to the enemy, all right? So, uh, verse 10, verse 9. If they say to us, wait until we come to you, then we will stand in our peace and not go up to them. But if they say thus, come up up to us, then we will go up. For the Lord has delivered them into our hand, and this will be a sign to us. So we're going to go to the stronghold. We're going to take them on, right? Amen. So both of them showed themselves to the Philistine garrison. And the Philistines said, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden. They're finally coming out of their holes, right? They're finally showing their face. Mm. <laughs> then the men of the garrison called to Jonathan and said to his armor bearer, Come up to us and we will show you something. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me for the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. Amen. And Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees with his armor bearer after him. When you are in spiritual warfare, when you are in praying with your brother and sister, you're going to climb up with your hands and knees. And you are going to be grinding, right? That's how it is. It's a tough climb when you're first fighting in spiritual warfare, especially with your brother or sister. It's always a grind. And... Let's continue on verse 13. And they fell before Jonathan. They fell before him right then and there. After the grind, after the hard climb, they fell before Jonathan. Enemy was defeated. Amen. And as he came after them, his armor barrier killed them. Amen. That first slaughter, which Jonathan and his armor barrier made, was about 20 men within an hour and a half of an acre of land. Amen. So, all right, they're starting to make moves. When you start your spiritual warfare, this was just a small garrison, right? This was just the beginning. But 20 men against two. Think of the odds. The odds of two men all of a sudden being able to kill 
20 trained soldiers. That is a sign right there that God is with you. All of a sudden, you take out a garrison of Philistines, 20 men. Glory to God. You are emboldened then when you start taking the small steps against the enemy. Right? The small steps. Don't be despising the day of small beginnings. The small steps. You are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus who gives you the strength. Glory to God. There is so much more. We're going to keep reading. Amen. Verse 15. There was a trembling in the camp, in the field, among the people. The garrison and the raiders also trembled, and the earth quaked, so that it was a great trembling. Earthquake right there. It was a sign God was right there with them. God was going to drive the enemy away. They were going to flee before Israel. Jonathan and his armor bearer first made the headway. They were on the attack. That's two. Now you're fixing to have the army of Israel right behind you, and it's fixing to begin. Now, the watchmen of Saul in Gibeah, Benjamin looked, and there was the multitude melting away, the multitude of Philistines, the multitude, a mini amount, a whole army started melting away. They were trembling because what God was doing in the camp of the enemy. And the multitude melted away, and they went here and there, just going all over the place. All right? Amen. They were just melting away. Then Saul said to the people who were with him, Now call the roll and see who has gone from us. And when he had called the roll, surprisingly, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. Wait a minute. This is how it is in the church. You're like, wait a minute. Who was praying? Who was praying against the enemy? Glory to God. It was two people right there. That's all you need to begin with. It's two. And John and Saul said to uh, Ahijah, bring the ark of God here. For that at time, the ark of the God was with the children of Israel. Now it happened while Saul talked to the priests and made a noise, which was in the camp of the Philistines, continued to increase. So Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. I want to stop for a second and think about this. You know, during those times against the battles of the Philistines, or whoever the enemies of Israel were, the children of Israel would always bring out the ark, right? Why would they do that? Well, it's a sign that God was with them. You know, it was supposed to strike fear into the enemy, right? Because God had arrived. But God was already with Jonathan and his armor bearer at the beginning. He wasn't necessarily right there at the ark, right there. He was already with Jonathan and his armor bearer because they took the bold initiative to go into the enemy's camp, right? Many times, and many times when you think about it, not all the time, but the Israelites, for lack of better reason, explanation, they brought the ark with them as more of a an object for inspiration, not necessarily thinking that God was with them. They brought they used it as an idol to go after the enemy. Right? But God was already with Jonathan and his armor barrier. But yet they bring the ark. God was already with Jonathan. They did not necessarily have to bring the ark of God. With them, they did not necessarily have to bring objects with them into battle. Some may trust in horses, right? And some may trust in chariots. But we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. You don't have to bring religious objects. And I know I'm going after some, some denominations in this, but some denominations have religious objects as idols that they pray to. And that's not the right way. That's not how you pray to God. No. God wants you to worship him in spirit and in truth and pray to him in spirit and truth, right? You don't necessarily, you don't at all need a 
object with you. You don't. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart, the heart of men and women who want to serve and worship him. The object is not necessary. It's certainly not godly. Don't put anything before God. Now, that was just a tangent. Let me go back to the main point here. <laughs> Verse 20. And Saul and all the people who were with him in assembly, and they went into battle, and they indeed every man's sword was against the neighbor, and there was very great confusion. So now the children of Israel followed after Jonathan and his armor bearer into battle. And the enemy was in great confusion, regardless of what uh, Saul had done. Moreover, the Hebrews who were with the Philistines before that time, who went up to the Philistines, who went up with them into the camp from the surrounding country, they also joined the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. So now it's a rout. The enemy is now fleeing. Likewise, all the uh, men of Israel who had uh, hidden in the mountains of Ephraim, when they had heard that the Philistines fled, they also followed hard after them in battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle shifted to Beth Hevon. <clears throat> now here's something else we're going to dive into. This is interesting. <clears throat> Saul's rash oath. Think about this. And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had placed the people under oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats any food until evening, before I have taken vengeance on my enemies. So none of the people tasted food. Now, yeah, this and this is going to be something interesting I'm going to talk about. This was probably one of the most idiotic things Saul had done as his reign as king. He takes an oath and tells his congregation, right, not to eat or drink not to be strengthened. If a pastor tells you not to read your Bible or to pray, you would think that would be the most stupid thing that pastor could tell you to do, right? And yet that is exactly what Saul did right there. He was telling his congregation not to pray, not to eat, not to sustain your strength. You're supposed to be filled with the word of God. Be ready in season and out of season, right? It's just like the church back in the Middle Ages. They did not want the people to read the Bible. They did not want, they wanted to censor the Bible to the people because if people actually started read the Bible, they would realize that much of what the church in the Middle Ages taught them was complete heresy, such as giving money for the souls of your dead relatives so that they could go up to heaven. That's not how salvation works. You don't give money for the souls of dead souls of your family members so that they could reach eternity in heaven. But in the Middle Ages, that's what the church did. The corrupt church. And when the corrupt king gives an oath and says, I don't want you to eat or drink or sustain yourself in the word until mine enemies are defeated. It was the most idiotic thing a king could say or do. Do not make any oath for that matter. Christ said, don't make an oath. This was probably one of the most stupid things Saul did. So let's keep reading. Now all the people of the land came to the forest, and there was honey on the ground. Let's back up for a second. He said, curse is the man who eats any food until evening before I have taken vengeance on my enemies, right? So none of the people tasted food. They were becoming weak because of this. This was stupid. Now all the people of the land came to the forest and there was honey on the ground. The word of God 
is on the ground waiting for people to take and eat. No one's going to read the word, though, <laughs> because of what their commander told them to do. He said, do not eat. Do not pray. So here we go. But Jonathan had not heard his father's charge, the pe- uh, father's, uh, his father's charge, w- the people with the oath. Therefore, he stretched out the end of his, of the rod that was in his hand and dipped it into the honey in a honeycomb. And he put his hand to his mouth, and his countenance was brightened, or he was enlightened. Right? What is a rod, a symbol of. Jonathan had a rod. A rod is a symbol of authority. Amen? Jonathan had authority because his father was the king. When we have authority, when we are given the rod, we, when we are a child of the great king, right, we have authority over the enemy. And when you take that authority you have and you dip the authority into the word, into the honey, you become enlightened on how you can defeat the enemy. Praise God. The authority that you are given from God above with the rod that you have, you dip into the honey and you eat that honey with the rod. You are enlightened. It said he was, in, he was brightened and enlightened. Praise God. That's how it is for us. Then one of the people said, your father strictly charged the people with an oath saying, cursed is the man who eats food this day. And the people were faint. The people were faint. They were, this was a weak congregation, a weak congregation that could barely defeat the enemy. The only reason they were able to go into battle in the first place was because of the two, Jonathan and his armor barrier, that would go out against the enemy. And now that the bold young Jonathan went out against the enemy, he now sustained his strength in the word and the authority that he was given in the word. Praise God. But Jonathan said, my father has troubled the land. That's right. He has weakened the congregation because of this. Look now how my countenance has brightened because I tasted a little of this honey. Oh, you get it. Because he ate of the word. His countenance was strengthened. He was enlightened in God's power. Praise God. How much better if the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies, which they found. For now would there not have been a much greater slaughter among the Philistines. If you would go into the enemy's camp, just like Jonathan did, and take back what the enemy stole from you in boldness and demand, not just take back what you were uh uh, what was taken from you, but you take more of what the enemy had. You get a hundredfold. Amen. You get what I'm saying? Take back. And the enemy has to repay you. Repay you for everything that they stolen from you. Glory to God. Now they had driven back the Philistines that day from Michmesh to Alajan. Ah, Jalon. So the people were very faint. Yeah, they defeated the enemy all right because of the leadership of Jonathan. But the people were faint. Your father, the king of this congregation, weakened the people. If it wasn't for the boldness of the king's son, the church of Israel would have been sorely defeated that day against the enemy. So now, all right, so now for context, they're going to cast lots. They're going to cast lots and say, who has sinned in Israel today, right? Then John, um, therefore, verse 41, Saul said to the Lord of Israel, the Lord God of Israel, give a perfect lot. So Saul and Jonathan were taken 
but the people escaped. And Saul cast lots between my son Jonathan and me. So Jonathan was taken. Then Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what you have done. And Jonathan told him and said, I only tasted a little honey with the end of the rod that was in my hand. So now I must die because I obeyed God? Why do I have to die if I obeyed God's word and I did not obey your foolish law? I want you to think about the church of the Middle Ages again. The people in the Middle Ages were burned at the stake because they did not follow after church tradition. After their law, right? Okay. If we hadn't had people like Gutenberg and Martin Luther printing the Bible and all of a sudden them reading the Bible and being enlightened in the Middle Ages. If we hadn't had those people, we would not have the church we have today. Jonathan, when he dipped his rod into the honey and became enlightened, told the people what they needed to do. And because of that, he was a hero because he opened the eyes of Israel. He wasn't just a hero because he went into the enemy's camp and defeated them and led them throughout the whole battle. He was a hero because he enlightened them to the power of God, to the power of the honey, the word of God, and the authority which is given to you with the rod. Amen? So now I must die? Jonathan, Saul answered, God, do so more also. You shall surely die, Jonathan. My law, my tradition, obey my law. That's what the church said back in the Middle Ages, my tradition. And they, many people were burned and were killed from the church because of this. But the people said to Saul, Shall Jonathan die? Who has accomplished this great deliverance in Israel? Certainly not. As the Lord lives, not one hair on his head shall fall to the ground, for he has worked, for he has worked with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan, and he did not die. Amen. The people I want you to get this. The people saw the truth. When Jonathan told them the truth, when he told them the truth, he said, you need nourishment. You need the word of God. You need to pray. You should dip your authority that you are given into the word of God. And you could go forth boldly into the enemy's camp and you can conquer all your enemies. Amen. It's a powerful word. And it's something I wanted to share with you all tonight. And I'm so glad I did. It blessed me. And I know it will bless many of you. God bless you, my brothers and sisters.